God bless you guys. Good morning. I'm Pastor Chris. If you're joining us on the online campus, God bless you guys. Welcome. We're excited to have you all here as well. Grab a donut, grab a coffee. If you haven't checked the kids in to Summit Kids, might want to go right now. Again, having a little trouble with our technology. We promise we are working on it. We've got an IT guy that's been so faithful in helping us try to fix that, but lots of challenges. So go ahead and get them checked in. Grab a donut, grab a coffee, grab your seat, and get ready for some amazing worship here in just a minute. God bless. I have three little kids, and they're wonderful, and I love them, but sometimes it's hard to take them to a restaurant. And I still wanted to get involved in Summit Sync Up. So a few of us had an idea. We got our kids together, we got some food, brought it to the park, and the kids played together. They ate together, and the adults got to talk, we got to hang out, and it was so much fun. My kid still comes up to me today, and he talks about that time and how much fun it was. So I encourage you, make it a priority. The first and the third Sundays, every month we have Summit Sync Up, and we want you to just go out, have lunch, or go to a park, whatever it is, make this a priority, and connect with each other. Good morning, Summit Church. All right, man, you guys, good looking bunch. I like it, what little I can see. Uh, I'm Scott Stone. I am one of the board members here at Summit Church, and I have the privilege of being able to announce something that's actually pretty special for us. At the end of the month, we have these uh, Sugar Rush pop-ups that are happening. And also, this happens to be the month of October, which nationally is uh, celebrated by churches to be Pastor Appreciation Month, if you didn't already know that. And I don't know about you guys, but I love our pastor. He does a lot of work for us. Give him, give him a round. Show him some love right now. And traditionally, we've always done like an offering and, and financially kind of tried to help Pastor Chris out and his wife. Um, but this year, PC actually came to us and asked for something a little different. Um, and this is why I mentioned the sugar pop-up. See, PC has a huge heart for this community, and he wants to reach it with everything we've got. And so one of the things that he asked us is that instead of just giving him money financially to bless him, how about we give money and bless these pop-ups? Let's go out and let's give everything we got to these pop-ups and to the community and so that we can reach out and show him appreciation that way. And I just thought that was amazing. What a great window into his heart and into what he's thinking and what God wants to do in this place. And so I am so excited to be able to be a part of that and I'm so excited to invite you all to join us as well. So don't worry, at the end of all that, the board's probably still gonna take care of PC. We don't have to worry about that part. But at least with the pop-ups, join me, join PC in making this the best that it possibly can be. Thank you. Thank you. uh, Thank you, Scott, for saying all that. And I do wanna encourage you, just be, you guys are so generous to Lisa and I, and you're so loving. Um, We feel very humbled and honored, but it would be such an amazing blessing to us and the really the love and appreciation would be multiplied if you would just help us make these events um, really amazing. I, I will be honest, they're going to be about $1,500 per pop-up, so that's $6,000 and you think, wow, how does it cost that much? Well, there's um, we had to get speakers because there's going to be music playing at these events and we're doing <clears throat> pardon me, playlists. There's, we're renting inflatables because uh, we want the, them to be insured at each of those places and um, themed. And uh, we're buying decorations for all of those. And usually we have to supplement the candy. And uh, there's a couple other fun things that we're going to do. And that just all adds up. And so I would really, really love it uh, if you guys would just be uber generous and make these such an amazing event and it would show us a ton of love and uh, we would thank you for that so much. Grab your bulletins if you don't already have them out. I get the privilege and honor of being announcement guy and we always know how well that goes when I do them. Um, So I'm probably going to miss a couple things. Uh, But there is a fall kickoff event for our ladies. Ladies, don't you love our women's ministry here? You guys really, really love being together, getting together, loving on each other. And um, Lisa has an amazing uh, get together planned every year in which you guys gather. There's a little vision cast and you talk about what you're going to do for 23 and 24. But it's not really just laying out a calendar. It's you guys connecting and having an amazing time together. And uh, we're getting close to that being a full event. So make sure that you are signed up for that. That's coming up on the 20th. And uh, there's going to be some fun desserts. It's out at the Bartlett's property and you'll get the address when you sign up for that. We don't 
try and give away everybody's addresses publicly. And uh, so make sure to sign up for that. You don't want to miss that. And it's going to be fun to get uh, a little peek at what you guys are going to be doing. I know that the leadership is really excited about just a few of those things as well. Hey, the 29th is going to be a very cool Sunday. We have for the kids Sunday fun day. Anytime there's a fifth Sunday, Heather does a great job of putting on an amazing extra weekend and there's an illusionist coming and your kids are not going to want to miss that. But we also encourage you, make sure you're bringing neighbors and friends and co-workers and helping them connect with the community like ours and uh, getting the kids in there to see a little illusion. And uh, also on that for adulties, if you are newer to our church and we say newer, like maybe you just haven't come to one of our Welcome to Summit lunches, we want to encourage you to do that. We do it right across the street at Brick and Barrel. It's really good food. And the best part is we pay for your food. So uh, you're welcome to bring the kids. There's a play area, not a play area. There's a patio outside where the kids tend to always want to go and hang out with each other. And then we just do some uh, awesome food and soda together. And we just get to know each other. It's really casual. There's nothing um, that's going to embarrass you or make you feel awkward or stand out. We get to know a little bit more about each other. We have a great time uh, doing that. And of course, uh, we really, really, really want to push how important these pop-ups are. This is us going into the community, being a part of this community, and uh, we need your help. So we need about 15 more people to sign up and volunteer to just be a part of one of these pop-ups. You can actually sign up for the one that you want to go to, and um, you just help hand out candy, or maybe you stand next to the inflatable, or you're there just greeting people. You're there kind of helping make sure everything keeps going well. Maybe you like to DJ, and you'll stand near the speaker and make sure it's not too loud. You make announcements, or whatever it is that you want to do to help, we have a place and a thing for you to do. And you can get onto the app and do that, or I believe we have, do we have a QR code? They can just... End of service. End of service. You're going to get. <coughs> you're going to get the code, QR code to uh, to scan that. And there's one right in your bulletin as well. You can just scan that and sign up through that. Amen. Amen. All right. We expect to see great signups. Fifteen of you. I'm trying to make eye contact, but the lights are so bright I can't see any of your faces. So, we'll just pretend I. All right. Ushers are going to make their way forward. We're going to bring God his tithes and our offerings, and um, we're thankful that um, there's very few things we get excited when we have to um, give money for it, right? And um, I'll tell you this, you don't, you don't have to give any money to be a follower of Christ, you don't have to um, tithe to get into heaven, you don't have to tithe to get God's grace. Um, but I will tell you this, the Bible is full of passages that say, if you will do this, then I will do this for you. And that is a relationship of reciprocity. God wants to receive from us trust and trust leads to obedience because when you tell your child, you just, you got to jump, you got to, you got to jump to me. Okay. I'm not coming up there to get you jump to me, jump down here to me. I promise I'll catch you. That's the, that's the payoff. I'm going to catch you. You won't fall, but you have to trust me and jump. And we were probably all there as a child where we had to trust our parent maybe for the first time in a situation we weren't sure they were going to deliver. And I just want to encourage you in moments where you have the opportunity to just trust God and jump, do it because I promise the catch is always amazing. When God catches us, it's always amazing. And I was just talking, I promise these aren't set up conversations, they're not made up stories. And I was talking to somebody yesterday or the day before, I think it was, ye it was yesterday, it was at a, a family gathering uh, for pizza. <clears throat> and I was talking to my niece and she said, I always watch my parents faithfully tithe when times were tough, when things were difficult, when I knew we couldn't afford it and they were always faithful to tithe. And she goes, so it taught me to be faithful as well. And she says, and I, I hated it for a while because I just didn't understand the need for it. She said, now I love it. I absolutely find joy in it because I know that God's blessing me. And she does. She lives a, a really blessed life and she's aware of her blessing. She's in that season now where she's realizing how favored she really is. And I thought that was amazing from a 20-something year old to realize that truth so early in life. 
So maybe that's a journey you're just now beginning. I want to encourage you to to kind of go down that journey. Father, thank you for this opportunity, like so many other opportunities in our life, to jump and trust you. And if we do, you're not just going to catch us, God, but the catch is going to be full of blessing and promise that only you can deliver. It's not like if we don't do this, we're going to all fall into poverty and and our lives are going to be stricken with curses. It's just, I don't know why anyone, God, would not want to experience the promised blessings that come with it. The favor, the things that are held aside for those who trust you in this way. Thank you for this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, since I was in high school, actually before that, since I was a little kid, I've always had good and close guy friends. In my neighborhood, there was a little boy that was on the street. He was my best friend, Martin. And then in high school, I had a lot of guy friends and we get into the college years. And here, when it was Heritage, I was a part of the group Axis and had a lot of really good guy friends. One of them actually ended up being my man of honor at Jared and I's wedding. And he had uh, a best woman because that's just the weird people that we are. Hello, is that better? Great. Um, so I've been around, we had a lot of nice guys in, and when I was in the college group, it was a lot of thinking like, could this be the one? Could this be the one? And they were nice guys, but for whatever reason, something just wasn't a good fit, right? Well, I heard about a nice guy through friends. And this nice guy, he was well-educated. Um, he was a good friend. He was a good father. Um, he had a good relationship with his sister. And the problem that I had with him is because he was well-educated, he thought he, knew, uh, he thought he knew everything. And he was one of those people that would correct you in the middle of a sentence if you said something wrong. So this guy, I think part of it, part of the reason why he was like this was because he knew he was a favored child growing up. You see, his parents weren't able to have kids, right? They weren't able to have kids, and then here he comes, this miracle baby. They have their miracle baby. Well, then they get pregnant again, and he has a little sister. She was always second best. Here we have the one who was a favorite child, and then we have the one who's second best. But maybe it's because she was a little overweight as a kid, but something pushed her to become a type A personality, right? To be a hard worker, a type A personality. And I think part of it might have been because her mom was so hard on her. She was so critical. But her mom had been critical to her and had been hard on her. And it, it was just really hard in that family to be accepted unless you were the golden child. Now, maybe you've heard of this friend too, this nice guy that I talk about. He was a Jewish paleontologist. Uh, he was in love with his sister's best friend named Rachel for many, many, many years. Anyone know who I'm talking about? <laughs> had a quirky friend named Phoebe. Uh, it's Ross, Ross Geller from Friends. Okay, this is, I told you I knew about him from friends, right? So this is a, a nice guy that I heard about. Um, anyway, so we're gonna play a game here. I'm gonna give you some directions. I'm gonna tell you about a family. I'm gonna come from a perspective, and I want you to tell me the TV show that it's from, okay? This game is called, what, whose family is this? Okay. I grew up with my two sisters. I lost my mom when I was really young. My dad is a perfectionist. He's a clean freak. My uncle is a carefree musician, and our family thinks every, or my friend of our family thinks everything is a joke. If you think you know, you can shout it out. Full house. Full house. Okay, yeah. Um, and then I go on to say, even though it was, hard, it was hard to lose my mom, my dad, uncle, and family friend helped us to raise us girls and teach us all the family lessons as much as possible. Full house. Second. Okay, second one. My mom is a stay-at-home mom, kind of. She's always trying to start her own business or work with my dad even though he doesn't want her to. My dad is always yelling at her and I see her cry a lot. It seems like he doesn't believe in her. But she keeps on trying to get into show business. You see, my dad's a band leader. I love Lucy, yep. My mom grew up in Jamestown, New York and my dad grew up in Cuba. It was, I love Lucy. Okay, here's the third one, I have two more. I was raised in Philadelphia, but my rough, in a rough neighborhood. <laughs> oh, you didn't even let me get into it more than a sentence. My dad abandoned me and my mom didn't know how to protect me, so she sent me to live with my family in a Southern California. They lived in a mansion. 
Yeah, and my aunt and uncle raised me along with my cousins. Man, you guys got that one fast. Okay, let's see about this one. Hands down, my daughter and I are freakishly linked. She's so smart and beautiful, and she's gonna rule the world one day. I want to know where she is and what she's thinking all the time. Our relationship is so different than with my parents. I'm not a lame parent like them. My parents always wanted to control me and make me who they wanted me to be, but I showed them I got pregnant in high school with my boyfriend. Gilmore Girls, Gilmore girls. thank you. <laughs> and uh, I went on to work, and now I live in Stars Hollow, and it's perfect life. Okay, so you guys got those ones fairly easily. Both good and bad patterns are passed down in families. And in some of the TV shows that we mentioned above, there are some good things that happened. We see like, parents step in, we see family members step in when it's needed, we see tenacity, we see engagement in relationships, but we also see a lot of family patterns that are negative, right? We see controlling, we see manipulation, we see perfectionism, and enmeshment, bitterness, control, all of those are just in Gilmore Girls alone, right? I mean, that show is pretty unhealthy if you look at the relationship in the family. Um, but when maladaptive patterns or tendencies are passed down from parents to children, refer to those things as either generational patterns, maybe you've heard uh, generational hurts or traumas or curses, all that kind of thing. I'm gonna say just generational patterns today, okay? That's how I'm gonna refer to it. So first, we're gonna look at Romans 5:12. What does the Bible have to say? When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. So we had one sin that came into the world, and then it spread to everyone, for everyone sinned, right? So in Genesis, when sin entered the world, it not only broke our relationship with God, it fractured our relationship with each other. Now our relationship with people have been, has been fractured. Think about it, Genesis 126, we have Adam and Eve and they're put in the garden and God says, go reproduce, take care of the whole planet. This is on the same level, they're going to take care of the planet together. Sin enters the world, uh-oh, what happens next? We allowed the greedy desire to make our own rules to come and to creep in. We wanted to make our own rules. We wanted to make our own ways. We wanted to make our own laws. And there were consequences to that. Now, do you remember Eve's consequences? Yes, there is more pain in childbirth, but what was the other part? Let's read it. And you will see, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. <laughs> right here, consequence. Was this? But was this what God was commanding to happen? Is this how we set it up in Genesis 1.26? No, that's not how he set it up. He set it up so that we rule together, so that we take care of the earth together. But what happened is this fracture in relationship, sin entered the world, and all of a sudden, there's the battle of the sexes, yeah. right? Which starts right here, right here. Yeah. Now, I'd like to say that it ended there, but unfortunately, it got passed down to their children this desire to make your own rules, to make your own laws. And here we have the Garden of Eden, we have Cain and Abel. And Cain decides that he's gonna bring God, um, he's gonna bring God an offering from his garden, because he farms, right? But does he bring his best? Nope, he just brings an offering. His brother Abel brings the best of his flock, the very, the firstborn lamb. And God accepts the perfect, he accept, accepts the righteous gift, and he doesn't accept the one that's just the leftovers. And Cain didn't like this. But here's what God told Cain. He said, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why do you look so resentful? If you do the right thing, won't you be accepted? But if you don't do the right thing, sin will be waiting at the door, ready to strike. It will entice you, but you must roll over it. The very next verse is, Cain was literally walking with God and God told him this. And in the next verses, Cain's like, well, uh, Abel, come with me. We're gonna go out here. And then he kills him, right? After walking with God. He let sin, he let anger come over him. He wanted to make his own rules and make his own laws. If he couldn't have it his way, then he didn't want his brother to exist at all. And then 
Go and behold, it gets passed down yet again. We see Cain's grandson. It makes mention of him and how he killed someone who had attacked him. This generational pattern just kept getting passed down of wanting to make your own rules, wanting to make your own laws. And we see it from the very first family that lived. So here's the thing about generational patterns and maladaptive behaviors. If they're not dealt with, it's like a clock that stops in time. So you're going with life, you're making decisions, things are changing, things are evolving, things are becoming uh, better, and then the clock stops. It goes tick, 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 and it stops. Our growth stops. The health stops in that area. That gets passed down to your kids, right? It gets passed down to us, and we pass it down to our kids. And this is gonna bring us to point one, to be the family that God wants me to be. I need to become aware of my family's baggage. I need to become aware of my family's baggage and we've all got it. We've all got that family baggage, right? Have any of you guys ever made a genogram before? Any hands out there? Okay, a few of you, a couple of you. Um, I worked in the psych world, so we made lots of genograms especially in family therapy or something like that, when someone gets stuck or if they don't understand why they are the way they are, something like that, we'll make a genogram. And it basically is like a family tree, but you can see emotional patterns, relational patterns, addictions, you can see all of that kind of stuff in it. So can you throw up a basic one? This is just a very basic genogram right here. Um, Women are circles, uh, males are squares, and then it'll start to add in colors and zigzag lines and stuff like that. It gets kind of intense as you start to go along. Um, A genogram goes beyond the the typical family tree. And when you start creating one, you wanna think of some different factors. So here, you wanna look at the relationship. You can just leave this up here. Was the relationship here harmonious? Was it hostile? Um, Think of all the different relationships like that. You wanna think, is there family feuds? Um, How do your, your families argue? Do they talk about something? Do they argue it out? Do they sweep it under the, under the rug? Um, what about cultural factors? We have religion, we have sexism. Um, I know that slavery ended in um, 18, what is it, 1865, but what was, when someone had that kind of trauma happen to them, it's gonna show up in families. So they're gonna raise their kids a particular way and they're gonna raise their kids a particular way and it's gonna stay in the family, right? Because those, those traumas are so significant, they impact the way that you live your life. Um, think about even veterans, right? They come back, they have PTSD. It not just affects them, it affects their family. If you know someone who's had PTSD, it really does, it affects the way that they communicate with each other. Think about if there was abuse or addictions or um, what kind of role did someone play? Did, were they the hero? Were they the victim? Were they the scapegoat? Were they the golden child? And as you can imagine, the more detailed you get, the crazier the genogram's gonna look. The more information you have though, that's the beauty because you can see the patterns more. The more in depth, you can go so in depth with this thing, you could spend forever building up on it. Um, and you can see the patterns that have happened throughout your family. Because remember, we're trying to look at our family, we're trying to understand our family baggage. So now I have one for you, you can pr- throw this up, it's also in your notes. Ross Geller's genogram. I didn't make this, so I don't completely agree with everything on it, but we have a few things we can look at. Ross is over here in this square, okay? And we have a dotted line between, like dotted dash, in between him and his sister Monica. That means that there's competition there. They were very competitive with each other. Um, You can see over here that Monica has a zigzag line to her mom. That that zigzag line means critical. And her to her mom, it was critical. Her mom was critical to her, she was critical to her. Um, We see that there's not a lot of divorce in the family except with Ross, who has three of them over here, right? Um, But if you look at Rachel, there's a note here. And Rachel's parents are divorced, right? So if you were to do a genogram with her, she's gonna see a pattern of divorce, right? She has one, her parents have one. You could kind of see, I mean, I'm not gonna go into full detail. You have it in your notes, you can look at it. Um, And I mean, mine looks way crazier than this, right? (laughs) I'm not throwing mine up there. Um, But you get the idea, right? The more information we have, the more we look at our family, the more things we can pick up with it. Now, There's more going on here. I like the quote that John Piper said. 
He said, sin is like a contagious disease. My children don't suffer because I have it. They catch it from me and they suffer because they have it. First Kings 15, one through three, we have a story here of one of the kings, Abijam. Abijam began to rule over Judah in the 18th year of Jeroboam's reign in Israel. He reigned in Jerusalem three years. His mother was Ma'ach, the granddaughter of Absalom. He committed the same sins as his father before him, and he was not faithful to the Lord his God as his ancestor David had been. He just committed the same sins. He didn't look at the family pattern and do anything about it. He just committed the same sins. And then we have a second story here. If we go to Ezekiel 18, 14 through 17, it says, now look, suppose that this child has a child who sees all the sins done by his parent. The child sees them, but doesn't follow in the parent's footsteps doesn't eat at the pagan shrines, doesn't worship the popular idols of Israel, doesn't seduce his neighbor's spouse, doesn't bully anyone, doesn't refuse to loan money, doesn't steal, doesn't refuse food to the hungry, doesn't refuse to give clothes to the ill-clad, doesn't live by impulse and greed, doesn't exploit the poor. He does what I say. He performs my laws and lives by my statutes. This person will not die for the sins of his parents. He will live truly and well. The difference between these two is the second story, we see someone who took great inventory of his, fa- of his dad's life, right? He looked and he saw that his dad cheated and he stole and he committed adultery and he made a big list of all the things that his father did. He saw what happened and he chose to do something different. So that's gonna be our second point here. So our second point is going to be to to be the family that God wants me to be. I need to do something different to make a change in my family. I need to do something different to make a change in my family. There are areas where the clock has stopped in time. Tick, tick. For my family, one of the areas might be in 1969 when my grandfather died. Now, My grandmother loved my grandfather very much. She's actually here today. Um, And they were very close. But that that death is an abandonment right there. It wasn't anything my grandfather did, but it's an abandonment. That's a hurt that goes with you, right? My mother experienced an abandonment by her father because her father is no longer with her anymore. Now, you can fast forward. We're going to fast forward to my mom when she gets married, right? She has no idea that my dad is starting to get into addictions when she gets married to him. Then he gets into an addictive lifestyle, and then it becomes too much. And then when I was four years old, my parents divorced. Now, this is another abandonment to my mom um, because he chose this over her, right? It's an abandonment to me. And then I grow up and I I have this with me and I'm walking with it. Now, my mom is like the most amazing single mother out there. She like gave up so much so that my brother and I can have an awesome life and I love her so much, but there's still these wounds that we carry with us that still affect the way that we live in our life. Now, um, if we keep going, we look at my story. I wanted to grow up and get married and have kids. Since I was four years old, see a connection there? I was four years old. I wanted to grow up and get married and have kids. That's all I wanted. Only I never saw my mom hold a guy's hand or kiss anyone or anything like that. I saw marriages on TV. I saw all the Nick at Night stuff. I loved I Dream of Jeannie. I love Lucy, Bewitched. I loved watching all that. I saw a full house. I saw these different relationships and, and I wanted to grow up, get married and have kids. And that was my mission, and I went to do it. When I was 15 years old, I met a guy, and, um, and he wasn't anything like my dad, right? He, he, wasn't, he didn't do drugs or alcohol or anything like that. But when we got engaged, he ended up getting an addiction to a video game. I thought it was just a phase. It's just a video game, right? Just a phase. Well, it became a full-blown addiction, and we got married, and he ended up, it ended up being the same circumstance, essentially. He wasn't present in the marriage. He wasn't present in the family. He was choosing other people and other things over me, leaving me abandoned yet again. And I was so hurt and so broken. And we ended up divorcing that next year when I was 19 years old. And you can imagine being a 19 year old who grew up in the church, knowing that God hates divorce. I was so broken. I was so broken. Was God, I did something God hated. 
Is God going to forgive me? Like, is he going to, what's going to happen? No good Christian guy is ever going to want me, right? I'm just used up trashes. That's how I felt. I was, it was a very, very low place in my life. Uh, it was a dark place, but I also made a decision. If I were to ever have a family, I wanted to make sure I passed down something different to my kids. I wanted it to stop here. So I did therapy. I did all the genograms. I talked to people. I had mentors. I worked through my stuff because I wanted to give my life. I wanted to work out all of the unhealth as much as I could to pass down something different for my kids in my family. There's a theory in couples therapy and it's called the Imago match. Harpo Hendricks popularized it, and basically it starts with the basis that we all have childhood wounds that we're walking around with, okay? You have this wound, it's like sticking out here, you're walking around with a childhood wound, and you wanna get healing for this weird, strange little wound that's here. Now, when you pick a partner, you either pick somebody who, um, well, actually, so you pick somebody based on two levels, a conscious level and a subconscious level. So on a conscious level, you're picking the perfect person. You're like, they're only gonna have perfect qualities and perfect traits. They're gonna love me, they're gonna be with me wherever I go, we're gonna have the same interests in every single thing that exists, it's gonna be amazing. Unconsciously, you are trying to heal the wound that you're walking around with. So, you end up actually picking somebody who has all the best qualities and all of the worst qualities from your parents. And I'm not saying that this is a 100% you know, accurate theory, but I like the idea of it because you're trying to heal these childhood wounds by picking out somebody who can essentially do that for you. That's what your hope is. But what I like about the theory is it's not so much about the person you pick. It's actually about you and who you are in the relationship. And that's a big deal because no family is perfect. You can't change who you are, uh, or so you can't change who they are, but you can change who you are and who you become. And it's never too late to grow and become the best version of yourself. So Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 says this, you were taught not to live the way that you used to. You must get rid of your old way of life. That's because it's been, uh, it has made impure by the desire for things that lead you astray. You were taught to be made new in your thinking. You were taught to start living a new life. It is created to be truly good and holy just as God is. We are taught that we are to live a new way. The ways that you've been walking around with, these hurts that you have that haven't been dealt with, that's not the way you're supposed to live, right? We're supposed to live a new way, a new way that God has given us. Romans 12, two says this, don't copy the, the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. If we don't change the maladaptive patterns in our family, we're essentially conforming to the way of the world, right? We've got to change it. We've got to do something about it. I was thinking last night when I was kind of going over this, I was thinking about being four years old and having a 4 t shirt. So just a tiny little girl's t-shirt, right? That's in my bag, that's in my luggage and I'm carrying it along. It works as a kid. You need to protect yourself as a kid. You need to make sure you're okay as a kid. The 4 t shirt 4T t-shirt works. Now, if I'm carrying that around into youth or adulthood, it's gonna look a little funny. It's not gonna fit the right way. It's not gonna function what, the way I need it to function. I have to unpack this bag. I have to take out that old t-shirt. I have to take out those, those family wounds that I have, the things that I needed to comfort myself when I was four years old, and I need to put on a new t-shirt that God has given me, right? I need to put on one that fits my size. We're gonna to go to point three here. To be the family that God wants me to be, I need to invite others in. So the first thing, you're looking at your family baggage, you're doing something about it, and you're inviting other people in. Have you ever met somebody who just isn't a stranger to anyone? You know, so they go to the grocery store, they know every person in line, they, they know the person in front of them, the person behind them, that's my father-in-law, um, Paul, he is so funny, he will, could start a conversation with anyone and he knows what their interests are, he knows what they're doing that day, all of that kind of stuff. When I came over to their house the first time to meet Jared's dad and his mom, he was walking around the house, do you want anything? Make yourself at home, you want anything? He followed me around with a thing of red vines. He's like walking around, you want a red vine? 
You want a red wine? I'm like, no, I'm okay, thanks. You want a red wine? You want a red wine? I'm okay, thanks. You want a red wine? Yes, I'd love a red wine, thank you. Uh, and I'm like eating red vines. I don't want them, but he's offering it to me and, and I want him to know that I accept it, right? That I, I'll take the invitation to be part of the family. Um, even though he's really just assessing me, like, are you a good match for my son? Um, but he's inviting me in and I felt loved and I felt welcomed. So think about your family. We have holidays coming up pretty soon. And people do a lot of different things for the holidays. But I, I think that the scripture has something to say about that. So let's look at Romans 12, 10 through 13. Love one another deeply. Honor others more than yourselves. Stay excited about your faith as you serve the Lord. When you hope, be joyful. When you suffer, be patient. When you pray, be faithful. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Welcome others into your homes. With the holidays coming around, maybe you're someone who has just a small get together, just your immediate family. Maybe you go over to your aunt's house and it's crazy. Everybody is there. There's like four types of pudding with marshmallow and Cool Whip in it. And your brother and uncle are fighting about politics and your mom's just over here like, I just want it to be a nice holiday. Like maybe that's it. Or maybe your family is so rough and you just don't even want to be around them because it's just a fight every time you're there. Maybe you're deployed and your family's across the country. All of us have different circumstances. We all have the characters in the family, right? All the different characters, and we all have different circumstances, but we're all called to love one another. We're all called to welcome other people in. When Jesus was at a Pharisee's house eating, he noticed what was happening. People were picking their places of honor at a table, because you're at a table and where you sit at the table from the head person represents um, your place of honor in the society. And he's watching them and he leans over and he talks to the host, he talks to the guest, and he, uh, to the host and says this, when you put on a luncheon or a banquet, don't invite your friends, your brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back and that will be your only reward. They like you, you like them. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. I don't think Jesus is saying that we shouldn't have friends and family over. I don't think he's saying that, but I think he's talking to the Pharisees who were so consumed with their position. They were so consumed with their comfortability in life. They wanted their life to be comfortable. Sound like any of us? We want our lives to be comfortable sometimes. And he's saying, don't worry about that. Don't worry about being comfortable. Don't worry about people praising you. Don't worry about your place of honor. Invite people in. Invite in the one who doesn't have anyone. Invite in that couple because maybe they have each other, but maybe they're alone. Maybe they're lonely. Invite others in. Jesus was pretty radical. Because if you think about it, family was huge in that culture. You needed to bring honor to your family. You could not bring down your family's name. And who did he say was his family? He said that those who serve the father's will are his mothers and brothers. That's his family. That's pretty radical. The radical Jesus said to those who will follow the will of God are his mothers and brothers, but letting others see how much you are well-known and well-liked by other people of high status. That was a big deal, like I mentioned. He said to forget all that at the banquet. Invite in the no-namer and make them special. Treat them like kings, treat them like queens. And that's the kind of radical behavior that I wanna be known for, personally. I want people to know that they're with, when they're with me that they're heard, that they're seen, that they're loved, that if they needed a place to go, that I would welcome them in and not judge them and have open arms. That's what I wanna be known for. If someone's gonna talk about me behind my back, let that be what they say, right? In this season, as we're walking into this season, the holidays are coming up. I encourage you not to just invite people in, but like do all of it. Invite them into all of the things, not just the big holidays, but if you're gonna go out and get a pumpkin spice latte, invite somebody. 
If you're gonna go to the pumpkin patch, invite people. If you're gonna go look at Christmas lights, invite people. Continue to invite people in because we all have those characters in our family, right? We all have the characters who are loud. We have the people who are only there on the holidays. We have the people who are, that we're closer to, some we're not as close to, but that's the same that it is in God's family. We have people who show up on the holidays only, right? We have people we're closer to, we have people we're not closer to, but all of them, no matter what, we welcome in. Anyone who comes through those doors, you're welcomed in, right? You need somewhere to go, you're welcomed in. We should be radical like Jesus and welcome people in. Love people the way that he loved people. This makes me think of my sweet friend Janelle. Um, I don't know if she ended up making it. Oh, she did, right there. Sweet friend Janelle, she's one of our chaplains here. And most of you know the hard year that she's had. I mean, a year ago she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And then it's just from there, it's been, you know, all the chemo, all of the appointments, the surgeries, everything. And then a couple months ago, it left her at a place where she was in the hospital and we didn't know if she was gonna make it or not. But to see God's family surround her was the most beautiful thing. Because so many people, countless people, countless people prayed. They had prayer meetings. They were meeting in parking lots. They were driving up to see her even though she wasn't awake or conscious or anything like that. People were surrounding her. She had a friend who was at the hospital with her that left for only like three hours the whole time that she was there, someone who fought for her. And you know why the doctors and the nurses were surprised and shocked? It's not because it was her blood family, it's because she had so many family members who were not blood family that were there and surrounding her. It stirred up something in them. Who is this girl? Who are these people? That's the family right? That's God's family. That's who we are to each other. Amen. So although life is messy and although family is messy and although we're messy, we're going to invite each other in. We're going to love each other. We're going to work our, our own stuff, right? All right, let's all pray today. God, thank you so much for inviting us into your family. You said that we're all brothers and sisters, that we are the adopted heirs. Thank you for being our father, for loving us, for having that father's heart for us, to invite us in, even though we didn't deserve anything, your arms were open and you did not turn us away. If there's anyone here that wants to be in invited into the family, God's not gonna turn you away. If you're ready to accept Jesus into your heart, I'd like you to just Slip up a hand right now. Okay. God, thank you so much for every person in this room. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask another question now. If there's anyone in here who, you have some family baggage you're carrying around and you're ready to let go of it. You're, you're ready to invite people in. Maybe you've been more closed off. Maybe you've been really comfortable, but you're ready to move past that in this season. You feel like God's prompting you to move past that. I want you to lift your hand up. Oh yeah, hands all over, hands all over. God, we come before you right now. Lord, help us to be your family. Help us to love people the way that you love people. Help us to have open arms. Help us to see the areas where we need to work on, where we need to stop the unhealth and put in a new way of thinking, a new health in our lives in the name of Jesus. We pray that you come and you fill each one of us up today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jamie. That was good. That was really good. It was especially good considering that um, last Thursday, as I was preparing my weekend message, I texted Pastor Jamie while her and her family were on vacation. And I said, hey, what, what, what are you speaking on? And she said, I'm doing unpacking church stuff. And I said, oh, I've already started on that. Um, so I need you to do something else. And uh, so she pivoted and uh, she said, do family. And she did awesome. And I appreciate that. I love, the, I love the theme and the tone that our families are messed up and we're never probably gonna escape that. But God in his loving grace gives us 
family by choice, not just by blood, and we've got each other. And that's why I believe community is so important. Amen? Speaking of community, uh, we've been putting these inside your bulletins, and I'm hoping you're using them to uh, invite a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, literally um, go next door and tuck this into your neighbor you, that you know have kids uh, or go a couple streets over. And if you are one who, uh, I had Brooklyn who does our notes and stuff on Fridays. I said, would you run me a hundred extra? Cause I'm going to walk uh, the streets of my neighborhood this week and I'm going to tuck these into the door because I want everybody in our neighborhood to come by and see that Summit Church loves them and is doing something fun for them and we expect nothing in return. Uh, we just want to create a moment uh, that they get to enjoy something and in um, and, and kind of a world right now where uh, everything costs something and, and everybody's feeling discouraged and and there's a lot of hopelessness and the chaos that's happening internationally and there's an uncertainty. We went to a concert on Friday night and somebody had talked to me earlier in the week and just said, hey, be careful, you know, it's, it's Worldwide Jihad Day and we can't even go gather in public places because we feel scared that somebody's gonna do something crazy. Isn't it nice that we have us in a community just saying, hey, this is a moment that you get to step back from the craziness and uh, have a few minutes with your kids and, and just some innocent joy together. If you want us to print you some of these and you'll promise to hand them out, let us know and we'll print extras and we'll have them next Sunday. And you can, or you can stop by the office and we can maybe try to get them done earlier. But um, please take these, hand them out to people and we need candy, like crazy amount of candy. Uh, we want all kids just be getting huge handfuls of candy. And I know there's people who are like, you should be giving out pennies or notebooks or band-aids instead of candy. No, because that's horrible and people hate you when you do that. <laughs> Don't, let's not be the weird church that gives out fruit instead of candy. You as a parent, if you don't want your kids to have candy, throw it away and you'll be the enemy. But we're going to be the good people. We're going to be the awesome people. We're giving out the worst of stuff. We've had people complain, you said donuts are terrible. Yeah, they are. But we don't get to do a lot as Christians, okay? We don't, you know, we don't have a bar out there. We're not serving tequila shots. We're having donuts. Give us a break, okay? And this is why I don't do announcements. Be sure to love on somebody today. Meet somebody new. Stack three chairs. God bless you guys. Be back next week for part five, four, five, four, whatever it is. <laughs>